Hello, and welcome to, I think it's, I'm gonna have to review the title. Ah. Curious, Creole, Curious Creole House of Diplomacy the French Legation in Texas. My name is Cynthia Evans and I am the site manager for the French Legation, which is in Austin, Texas. Um, and so you have a map here and I'm nearsighted, but I think that says French Legation. <laughs> Uh, on the site, we have a wonderful protected view that's protected by the city and the state. And you can see it here in the background. This is from our porch on the historic uh, house. You can see the Capitol. So this, I'm going to give you just a little bit of history and then turn it over to Kenneth. But the house and the land were purchased in 1840. It would have been 21 acres. And um, the house was then sold about two months later to the Catholic Church. They held it for seven years, and then they sold it to the Robertson family, uh, who held it for a little bit over 100 years. So what you see here is the French legation, the front of the house, the porch, the, the protected view is over here, and then this is the back of the house. Currently, we have an exhibit inside, and it talks about the three people who held the house the longest, which were the people that I spoke to you about, uh, Dubois, who only hold it, held it for two months, the Catholic Church, and the Robertsons. So just a little bit about of our exhibit. The site has been, or the state has been working on renovating the site, really to make it easier for uh, the public to access. So. So the building here uh, is what used to be referred to when the DRT managed the property as the carriage house. And then all of this was added. Uh, these are restrooms, three restrooms and water fountains. And then here is the kitchen, the reconstruction, reconstructed kitchen. And then uh, this is uh, an image, really a painting by the Robertson's daughter, Julia. Uh, she painted this. Uh, painting supposedly when she was 12 and then here's a bird's eye view of the site from an 1873 map so with that said let me go ahead and get to the meat of the show and introduce Mr. Hafferty Kenneth Hafferty is a professor of museum studies at Baylor University specializing in American archaeology or I'm sorry American architecture history, material culture, and decorative arts. He has taught in the Department of Museum Studies at Baylor since 2000. He is currently, he is a, he is currently the professor and chair of the department. His specialities include American material culture and decorative arts. His particular interests include American houses, churches, museums, public buildings, paintings, furniture, sculpture, and gravestones. He is the author of seven books, his two most recent books, The Material Culture of German Texas and Historic Homes of Waco, Texas, won the Texas State Historical Association's Ron Tyler Award for Best Illustrated Book on Texas History and Culture. His many articles include one on the Texas homes of Sam and Mary Maca Maverick and two on the Spanish Governor's Palace in San Antonio. Ken is working on more books about Waco, San Antonio, Texas, and the earliest professional gravestone markers in Texas. And so at the end, I have books up here to show you, and we can go over that later. But for now, I'll welcome Kenneth up to the stage. Better adjust this a bit. Can you all hear me OK? Till the Q&A period. Hi, guys. Um, good to see you all. And yeah, the French legation is a, I, I was kind of amazed when, when Mary Margaret asked me uh, to speak about the, the legation, which is back from my 80s period. Um, the semester that I finished my doctoral work at UT, you know, it was down to the proofreading, the typing out, this was when we had typewriters, and typing out the final official draft of my dissertation and I got a job as a tour guide at the French Legation. Uh, and it's like, well, that was random. 
And little did I know that all these years later, I'd be speaking about it at a wonderful conference at the Woody Museum. So, so that you never know what's going to, uh, going to happen. I've been ruminating about it as well uh, because the little book, which is for sale out at the book sale table, if you don't have your copy, you better hurry because it's getting close to sold out after all these years. Um, I wrote that before there was PowerPoint. <laughs> I wrote that before there was an internet. <laughs> and now I think, oh boy, wouldn't that have been something to have an internet uh, 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 to, to, to do the, the work on that. And I'm hoping to, th it really does kind of work out to speak about the, the French legation here because I want to, to do a sort of larger synthetic book on Texas material culture, perhaps 1836 to 1876 or 1820 to 1880, something like that, in bringing a lot of these different aspects together and coming up with what will hopefully be a more multicultural version of uh, the, the, the Texas past than tends to be the case in a lot of the, the histories that, that, that we see on our the, the, the bookshelves, I mean specifically of the, 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 the broader surveys. And there's lots of interesting work being done right now. So I, I think it, it should uh, 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 hopefully make for some, some interesting reading. And I'm glad that Cynthia was able to give you a sense of what the great condition that the legation is looking like today. The Texas Historical Commission, which took over from the Daughters of the Republic of Texas, have done a great job in restoring the, the, the house. Quite, uh, quite exciting to see it looking as good as it does. So that does my, my old Texas heart good to, to, to see that. And what we're going to do in this talk today is to uh, focus in on those earliest years of the legation, when in fact this house was built as a tool of diplomacy by a French dipl diplomat uh, representing King Louis Philippe to uh, uh, the Republic of Texas. And so in fact, here he is, this is our man of the hour. I wish I were the man of the hour, but it's actually the guy on the left. Uh, uh, Alphonse Dubois, who somehow managed to christen himself a count um, so that he became the Count de Saligny, um, which confused the heck out of his, his uh, bosses back in Paris because he kept signing it count and he was like, what is this guy doing? Uh, because he, uh, apparently he was intimidated by all the Kentucky colonels that were hanging around in Austin and uh, everyone was captain this or major this or colonel that. Um, if not general, and so he needed to be at least a count. Uh, but uh, apparently he was uh, 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 actually, as some friends of mine have said, he was actually an O count, but uh, that, that turned out to be true in a, a number of, of ways. But he was, in fact, uh, uh, the representative of Louis Philippe. He, the, why did he get this job? And the reason is that um, he happened to be uh, on the staff of the French legation in Washington, D.C. And this was at a point where not every uh, uh, country got an ambassador or had an embassy. A legation was for countries that, that were not quite major enough yet, not a superpower. So the United States only had a legation. And, um, and guess what the Republic of Texas got? Um, uh, they did actually get a legation, but the, the, the rank of chargé d'affaires basically means the person in charge of, of the business, uh, but uh, at a level under ambassador. And so the chargé d'affaires would be the head of a legation and would be assisted by one or more secretaries. And that is what Alphonse was, was a secretary, which, you know, and we think of secretary now as sort of, you know, secretarial work and, you know, uh, uh, paperwork and, and the like, which there was probably a fair amount of, but, but secretary was, was essentially, you know, a, a, a pretty substantive position to have. And when the Kingdom of France recognized the Republic of Texas, um, they already had someone who was in Washington, D.C. They were able to send him down to check out the Republic of Texas and see whether they should uh, uh, send a, a diplomatic representative down, uh, and he encouraged them, yes, uh, we, we, sh we should do that, and so the, the rest, it turned out, was, uh, was, was history. So it's interesting, because in some of the old records, not, not of the 1840s, but in the 20th century, 
Uh, there was a tendency to call it an embassy, and that was actually sort of kind of grandiose <laughs> compared to what was the, 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 the reality. In fact, there's a little street that's named embassy right by the legation, and I sort of roll my eyes and think about uh, the, the Robertson family sort of laying it on thick when, when they, they owned the house. But so it, so it goes. But um, this is the uh, capital of Texas to which this French diplomat who was used to a French lifestyle and to a very urbane lifestyle and ends up coming to Austin, Texas, which was less than a year old. And uh, you see here Austin the ideal and Austin the real. The ideal being the very regular city plan there, all of those straight, straight streets, north, south, east, west, uh, with a, a planned Capitol Square up at the top, actually done by a French Creole designer, L.J. Pillier, and Charles Schoolfield, who was uh, uh, an American. So they, they worked together creating this, this, this beautiful ideal plan of Austin. The reality in 1840 when Alphonse Dubois came to Texas was that it was a scraggly, pitiful collection of log cabins. <laughs> Uh, which basically defined Austin Avenue, uh, excuse me, Austin Avenue, Congress Avenue running up, and the only uh, east-west street, the one that you see there, is Pecan Street. So it was a pretty uh, simple um, uh, 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 arrangement, and, and you know, the somewhat abstract drawing, you actually see the Colorado River down at the, the, the bottom of the image, it looks like it's one block away from 6th Street, which was never the case, but be that as it may. Um, so it's probably not surprising that our French diplomat was not very excited about the accommodations that were available to him uh, in, in Austin. And in fact, he wrote to his uh, uh, boss back in Paris in June of 1840. I have not yet been able to obtain for myself any other lodging except a wretched wood shanty of three rooms for which I pay the trifling sum of $100 per month. Uh, and that was something back in 1840. I would like to find a more comfortable and above all a more appropriate dwelling, uh, but fear that I shall not succeed unless I have one built for myself. So he's going to have to take it uh, and in, into his own hands and build something more comfortable. The detail that you see on the, the left here shows the main hotel in town, which was Bullock's Inn. Richard Bullock was the, uh, the principal innkeeper. And as you can see, other than the president's house, this is about the only two-story house in Austin at this point. And uh, when he got to, uh, to Austin, uh, Dubois and the, the folks who accompanied him basically had to, uh, to uh, stay initially at, at Bullock's Inn. And um, things were not too much better in November of this year when Dubois wrote uh, to Paris, I have been unable to find a suitable lodging and consequently decided to build a house on a beautiful piece of property that I bought for that purpose which was beyond East Avenue, which is where I-35 is today, the, the little hill to the, to the east of that, known as Robertson Hill. Unfortunately, the difficulty in obtaining building materials, and especially my long illness, have held up the work considerably, and I fear that I will not be able to move into my new house before spring. I have, therefore, resigned myself to receiving guests in this humble dwelling, that's his three-room wood shanty, uh, where I am now camping rather than living, uh, and do the honors of the house as best I can. So he was pretty horrified at conditions in Austin. In fact, he, uh, when, when there was not much diplomatic work to be done when the legislature was not in session, the, I should say the Congress of the Republic of Texas, he uh, did manage to take some nice long vacations to New Orleans, which were, uh, was a lot more congenial to him. There were more people who spoke French, like tons of people who spoke French, as opposed to very few in uh, Austin. Well, that first month of staying in Richard Bullock's Inn uh, was painfully expensive. And here actually is the bill, uh, at least as it's recorded in the diplomatic correspondence. Now, Dubois could have jiggered the numbers when he was copying this, this down, but this is what we know. Uh, in, in other words, it's the only version that survives at all. And you can see that it includes stabling for horses, a month's room and board for Monsieur de Saloni, um, 
half price for the two servants who were, were free French uh, men, uh, um, and also half of that for uh, the Negress Rosanna, five days food and lodging for the secretary, keeping the secretary's horse in a stable, expenses for the Negress Flora, and care for the Negro Henry. It just sort of adds up, and a month's room rent for storing his trunks, which is another $40. So this total that he uh, was said to owe, owe Bullock was $323.75. Now, uh, the internet is a good thing because uh, I was able to look that up and see what would $323 be in real dollars. And you can see that it's about $10,000 in modern monetary. So uh, he was... He was being basically taken for a ride there, is the long and short of it. But he was off to a very bad start with, uh, with, with Richard Bullock, uh, who you know, was a private citizen of Austin. He wasn't really connected to the government of the Republic of Texas, but, but uh, was well known in town. I will mention, as long as we're on this, that this bill uh, you know, was basically Dubois whining about how he was being ripped off, which he was. But this is only the only documentation that we have about his enslaved workers that he owned. This, this document uh, is the only thing that, and gives us their names, that Rosanna and Flora and Henry were enslaved people that he had purchased apparently in Louisiana and brought them with him to Texas. So it's, it's amazing that, that, you know, it, just, just, just because he was whining that we knew, know who his enslaved workers were. Um, and so we're able to figure from that, the, uh, the staff of the French legation, um, that he brought with him a secretary. That was the position that he had in Washington. So he has to have a, a, a flunky to, to do the actual work for him. And so that was a guy named Jules Dulang, who was a Frenchman. He brought with him as well two other men, uh, Eugene Pluyet, who was his butler, or sometimes is referred to as his manservant, uh, and Charles Baudin, who was his chef. And that's kind of interesting. I think he was probably the only person in Austin who had his own personal chef. Now, the name Baudin is interesting, too, because that's actually the name of a French admiral at the time. It's like, what? <laughs> that, that's kind of funky. And I wonder whether that's not a, a alias that this, this guy had and just figured, well, you know, as long as he's, as my boss is gonna be a count for the, the time that he's in Texas, I might as well be Charles Baudin. And boom, there you go. So, and in addition to those three free Frenchmen, there were also the three enslaved servant, servants, Henry, Rosanna, and Flora. And um, Flora uh, apparently became ill on the trip from Louisiana and passed away so that she was, was not uh, uh, in the service of uh, Dubois de Saligny very, uh, very long. And we'll come back to this image. You're looking, you're looking down 6th Street towards the, the, the entertainment area. This is 6th this is and Congress uh, in 1840, as remembered many years later by, by Julia Robertson. And uh, so, uh, but, but on Charles Baudin, our, our personal chef, um, the, the, the kitchen that was recreated uh, at the French legation in 1966 by uh, uh, Rayford Stripling, who was the, the preeminent restoration architect in Texas at that time, uh, is gloriously romantic. Supposedly, it's on the foundations or the footprints that were ascertained by archaeology. Um, the result, however, is a building that's probably larger than most people's houses in Austin, period. So, you know, it's sort of um, amazingly romantic in terms of, of expecting uh, what uh, uh, the, the would have been a, a kitchen as, as an outbuilding. So, uh, all that being said, uh, it has a pretty impressive collection of French cooking uh, goods, which uh, John Ward Beretta, uh, a, a San Antonio name, and his wife, who was a member of the DRT, uh, decided that they would furnish this out of their own pocket. And so they took a trip to New Orleans and bought and bought and bought, and boy, did they come up with a lot of nice stuff. Uh, it's completely without any basis in the historical evidence. Uh, but uh, there, there you have it. And um, 
that you see, one of the, one of the cool things that THC has done in the, the restoration of the house is that they've painted the reconstructed buildings gray because they are such guesswork. The, 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 the house itself, the historical uh, 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 building is painted white, but then the kitchen and the quote unquote carriage house uh, are uh, painted gray to indicate that they're, they're later speculative, very speculative buildings and um, uh, uh, bas basically to be seen as a support for the, uh, the, 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 the main uh, historic building at the, the legation. And the interesting thing uh, about, about uh, our, our chef at the legation, Charles Baudin, uh, on one of those frequent vacations that Dubois took to New Orleans, not much to do, the boss is away, so what, what do you do? Well, maybe you go into business for yourself and rent a spot on Congress Avenue and buy an ad in the local newspaper. And so from the Daily Bulletin of Austin, December 1st, 1841, confectionery. The undersigned informs the public that he has reopened his store in a house lately occupied by Messrs. Robinson and Johnson uh, as an apothecary's shop, where the public will always find a large assortment of cakes of the best quality, bonbons, and every variety of candies. He can do catering, and there's hot coffee at all hours. So in Austin, Texas, in 1841, you could get hot espresso any time of day. Not much has changed, has it? Um, so one, one of the interesting things is that, that the Berettas, when they were, were doing their, their collecting for the legation kitchen, they bought a, a book called Les Confessions Modernes that was published at Paris in the early 19th century. But it's very specifically cakes and confectionery recipes and the like. And so that's certainly the sort of thing that, 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 that would have been of great interest to Charles Baudin. So, so that, that was kind of a, a, an interesting acquisition that was, uh, that was made. So thinking our way through that and about the sort of elegant food that could be served, not to mention all the French wines that were also brought to Austin. These were all served in his little three room house on West Pecan Street. It was like a pecan at, at La Vaca or Guadalupe, somewhere really kind of on the outskirts to the west of town at that point, which is strange to think of that being the outskirts. But, um, and so Alphonse Dubois could have dinner parties. And so this is actually a typical dinner party uh, that, and you know, the, the, where Alphonse might host a congressman of the Republic of Texas, Isaac Van Zandt, um, and a, uh, a French priest, Father Jean-Marie Audin, who was the, the first uh, Catholic bishop of Texas, and Sam Houston, who uh, was the first president of the Republic of Texas. So two things, small party, right? But when you only have a three-room shanty, you can't fit many people into your dinner parties. Uh, also, it's all male. Boy, now that's a drag. How can you have a fun dinner party when it's only men? But that was actually fairly typical. If you look at, at uh, Henry Sargent's painting, The Dinner Party, that's at Museum of Fine Arts Boston, it's all males. It's like, you know, the main meal of the day. And, you know, completely gender segregated. So interesting to, to think of it in that terms. So one of the coolest things that, that, that was available at the time that I was working on the book on the legation back in the, the late 1980s was that there was actually a, a letter that was written by one of the people who came to a dinner party uh, at the, uh, uh, the Charget's house. And that's Isaac Zan Van Zandt. And he represented Harrison County and uh, Marshall up in Northeast Texas. And um, so he, he wrote this to his wife, who was, I believe, back in uh, Marshall at this point. So she couldn't have been invited anyway. Um, and, uh, so, and he specifies that this was, was at a party with Dubois, Sam Houston, and Jean-Marie Audin. It was the most brilliant affair I ever saw the most massive plate of silver and gold, the finest glass, and everything exceeded anything I ever saw. We sat at the table four hours. I was wearied to death, but had to stand it with the company. 
uh, we had plates changed about 15 times. So this seems to have been sort of the endurance competition as far as, you know, how much wine can you drink and how many uh, French pastries can you, can you have. Um, so, uh, and the interesting thing is that Isaac Van Zandt was a very committed Baptist. I would really love to know if he sampled the wines or was he sitting for four hours watching the other three guys have uh, all these, these wines. So uh, there, there you go. Uh, by the way, I've sort of wondered this for many years, um, but uh, finally, now that we're in the age of the internet, I was able to get on findagrave.com and do a little genealogy with that name, Isaac Van Zandt. Uh, it turns out that he is like the great grandfather or great-great-grandfather of Towns Van Zandt, the Texas singer-songwriter, <laughs> wrote Poncho and Lefty and tons of other, yeah, actually kind of looks like <laughs> his, his ancestor, but one, one of Isaac's sons moved and became a founding father of Fort Worth, and so Towns came, comes down through, through that line. So freaky. Uh, so that, that's your gee whiz moment for the day. Um, one of the things that came out of dinner parties like that and having this close association with uh, Father Odin, uh, one of the big issues for the Catholic Church was they wanted to restore clear title of the missions here in San Antonio. It was really kind of up in the air with the revolution and what was the standing of the Catholic Church vis-a-vis -vis the Republic of Texas. And so apparently with Dubois' help, the, uh, the, the Congress of the Republic of Texas permitted ownership to revert to the Catholic Church of all the missions. So success, woohoo! Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, as many of you know already, is that the Catholic Church immediately turned around and rented the Alamo Chapel to the U.S. Army <laughs> as the, 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 the start of Fort San Antonio. Uh, and uh, in fact, that's how the curvilinear par parapet ends up on the Alamo, is to cover the army's wooden roof that was installed over the, the collapsed roof where the, the mission roof had, uh, had been. So all of that is sort of coming out of these dinner parties on West 6th Street in, uh, in, in Austin. And of course, this is the, uh, Odin and uh, Father Timon were the, 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 the ones who uh, ended up purchasing the house of the legation from Dubois, so, so it's just, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that, Cynthia, because that you know, really ties in with the sort of politics uh, and the, the, the politics of religion in the early republic. But the saddest thing that happened in Dubois' time uh, in Austin was the Pig War. And ironically, this goes back to his arch enemy, Richard Bullock. Bullock, in addition to being a very high-priced hotelier, uh, also had uh, pigs that he allowed to roam free uh, throughout the entirety of Austin. And um, the, these pigs were quite aggressive and quite hungry. And so the, basically they were left to fend for themselves. And so uh, they ended up trotting down West 6th Street and found themselves at the fence, such as it was, of Alphonse Dubois. Uh, um, and Dubois wrote in March of 1841 to Texas's Secretary of State, James Mayfield, every morning one of my servants has to spend two hours in repairing and nailing up the rails of the fence that these animals trample down to get at the corn for my horses. One day three pigs even penetrated to my bedroom and ate my linen and destroyed my papers. So he was not very happy at all uh, with the behavior of these particular porkers. And the fact that they were owned by his arch enemy, Richard Bullock, was uh, uh, even, uh, even more so. Well, uh, from the point of view of Bullock, he thought that, uh, um, uh, that he was being treated unfairly because Dubois uh, decided to take matters into his own hands and started killing Bullock's pigs and ordering his servants, Eugene Pluyet, to kill pigs as well. So Bullock complained that soon after Dubois refused payment of that very expensive bill, uh, Bullock suffered detriment in the loss of hogs, which have been most maliciously and wantonly killed with pitchforks and pistols used by Dubois and a Frenchman in his employ called Eugène, or by servants under Dubois' direction. 
he, he, Bullock, supposed the number of hogs killed by them between 15 and 25, um, the value of which he thinks would be about $100. So, you know, add that to his bill, already uh, uh, in progress, and the calculation there is that $100 then would be over $3,000 today. So pretty expensive porkers uh, in, in the, uh, the, the long term of things. So things were getting pretty hot, pretty inflammatory here. And uh, this and uh, all of the other letters from Dubois that I've quoted have been translated and published by Nancy Barker, who is a professor of history at uh, University of Texas and uh, did a, a wonderful two volumes of the diplomatic correspondence. Of, uh, I, I could not have written my book if she had not done all of the scholarly work on, on that. So uh, thank you up in, uh, in heaven, Nancy Barker. Um, so Dubois didn't think he killed 15 to 25 pigs. He said, oh, it was only five or six. Uh, and not only that, they had it coming. The nerve of those pigs. They got into my yard and they were eating my corn and, and eating my state papers and just all sorts of things. Well, it came to a head on February 19th because Richard Bullock confronted the pig killer, Eugene Pluyet, in the street at Congress Avenue and Pecan Street. And they started fighting with each other and kicking each other and Bullock threw stones at him and hit him in the head. He started to bleed, so there's blood running all down his face. Well, the building in the back behind the corner building that says Beatty, number five was actually the office of the legation. So that the idea of the house up on the hill out of town, that was the mansion of the legation. But the business office was on, on East 6th Street. And so uh, Eugene Pluyat, with blood streaming down his face, basically dove into the office of the legation. And that was sort of like the magic line that Bullock could not cross over because you know, that, that would become French space. And so, uh, so, so basically, Pluyat was saved. So uh, it just turned into this complete diplomatic fiasco known as the, the Pig War. And uh, this was not just a local event. This was heard about all over Texas. And in fact, some newspapers started to editorialize that, um, that, that this, uh, this Frenchman had a haunty, haughty temper and that um, he was just trying to entangle poor innocent Texas with, with, uh, with France. And the editorial in the San Augustine paper uh, concluded, go at Texas, viva la pigs. So the pigs had their supporters uh, in, in, in Texas in 1841. Um, so pretty crazy all, all in all. And th this was a little embarrassing to the foreign office back in Paris. Uh, the Ashville Smith was the, the Texas charge in Paris and was having to discuss this stuff with the, the French foreign minister. And uh, Ashville Smith later said that the, the French foreign minister told him, France can, can afford to be wrong on occasion, but it cannot afford to look ridiculous. <laughs> and that, that it was pretty clear that that was what, what was going on here was that, um, that uh, du Dubois was really out of control. He kept powering on though, even though he once again retreated to New Orleans for some more vacation, uh, but he continued to have work done on the house, even though it was now, as Cynthia pointed out, it was now owned by the Catholic Church. But his, the agreement of that was that he would complete the house and furnish it. And so in the Texas Sentinel, one of the other Austin newspapers, in August of 1841, says that his, Dubois's house has been, uh, in this city, has been newly fitted up as of late and furnished with costly furniture, wines, provisions, etc., etc., in readiness for his reception in the event of General Houston's election. This we have from Saligny's principal superintendent and butler, that is to say, Eugene Pluyet, once again, uh, who survived his ordeal over the, over the pigs. So, you know, things are getting well. The bar is well stocked. We're, we're ready to go. Um, and by golly, Sam Houston did get elected president again. But the thing that Dubois did not realize was that Sam Houston had no intention of staying, keeping the capital in Austin. And in fact, the capital moved back to Houston. And so the upshot of that is in August of 1843, when William Bollard uh, visited on entering the city of Austin, lo, dreariness and desolation presented themselves. 
few houses appeared inhabited and many falling to decay. The legation of France, complete with the air quotes there, empty, its doors and windows open, palings broken down and appearing as if it would soon be in ruins. I imagine maybe a few pigs ran down the, the hall of the house, but the pig war never happened uh, at the, the actual uh, the mansion of the legation. That was in down, uh, downtown. So the, uh, the interesting thing is that the legation is you know, the oldest building left in Austin. It is the oldest house. And um, it has been acknowledged as, as very significant for quite a long time. You're seeing here details from two drawings that were done in the 1930s by the Historic American Buildings Survey. And HABS was one of those New Deal programs that would put out of work architects to work doing measured drawings of historic buildings. And the idea was that, it, that they wanted to do drawings that were detailed enough to where if, God forbid, something happened to the historic building that was being documented, it could be recreated because you had what, what were the equivalent of architect's plans uh, uh, circa 1934. And so um, here you see the, the front elevation of the legation and the, the, the floor plan. So it's been acknowledged as a very important building for a, uh, a long time. Um, but uh, let us stop here for just a second uh, because the, the, the plaque that used to be on the house, which is from the Daughters of the Republic of Texas time, used to refer to this as being in the Louisiana Bayou style. And there's definitely free, Creole aspects to this house, but it's not entirely Creole. And so it's important to look at what's Creole and what's not. And in fact, the, the, the image that you saw showing the front and the back of the legation is really interesting because the, uh, uh, the, the front really looks to be something out of Louisiana, mainly because of the front porch that's added on there. And front porches like this were not on rural houses in France. The, and that's because of the climate. But if you look at the back of the legation where there's no porch, it looks like it could be in you know, Normandy or something. So it's interesting how significant that porch is. And of course, the porch was an accommodation to the heat in Texas or Louisiana or elsewhere along the Gulf Coast. So that's significant right there. The, 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 the porch, oops, let's go back here for just a second. Um, yes, I wanted to go. To, I like my, blue, my green laser here. It's a very good Baylor color here. Um, the thing that's interesting is that um, this is unlike any other porch that you will find in Austin or really by and large in Texas because you see that there's a single column at each end and then pairs of columns. So there are actually 10 columns, but this sort of treatment of paired columns is very French. You can find that on all sorts of much higher style buildings than this because, you know, this is a fairly vernacular building, uh, but it has this, this subtle French play on the classical orders of, this, of the Doric uh, order. So, so that's something, and you can see it here in the, the, the plan as well. So those paired columns are an interesting aspect of this that gives the front of the building a sophistication that you don't find in a lot of, you know, uh, Texas ranch houses where, you know, maybe wooden, wooden posts just sort of stick up. Higgledy piggledy. This is actually, you know, a very thoughtful and sophisticated sort of column. Um, you'll notice as well that there are double doors, two panel doors, which is uh, quite interesting. But in addition to that, there are French doors, double doors once again with uh, four panes of glass in each one. So it's partially glazed and partially solid, the panels down below. And then these windows that you see here are six over six sash windows, up and down windows, which are not original to the house. Um, that in fact, the house had casement windows. So, uh, and those have been restored back uh, now. But uh, so the fact that it's incorporating French doors, which allows entry into the two front rooms in the house from the porch is another feature that you tend to find in Creole houses. 
That being said, when you look at the floor plan, the thing that strikes anybody uh, who's, who's compared architecture is that this is actually uh, a pretty American floor plan here in that it has the central passage with staircase, two chimneys, uh, and each chimney uh, supports two fireplaces on each side, large front rooms and then smaller back rooms. So in spite of all the Creole features, and part of the, the, the reason that, that French Creole houses in Louisiana have the French doors is that you don't need a central passage. Uh, in in, uh, in uh, Louisiana, this is considered a waste of space because the hall is just something you pass through to get to another house, uh, another room in the house, which actually the Germans didn't like central passages either. You have to, to go all the way into the 1870s. And in fact, the Steve's house here in San Antonio is one of the first German houses where they had enough money. It's like, let's go crazy. Let's put a central passage in. Um, so that's, that's a cultural determinant as well. So uh, all interesting uh, stuff here. So, so it's a mix. There are influences from Louisiana. There are influences from American building. And there's also influences from France. So uh, a pretty interesting mixture that, that really is quite curious and quite, quite unique. The interesting thing is living in Austin at this time was Thomas William Ward who was uh, actually from Ireland, but had worked as a builder in New Orleans. And he came to Texas and uh, was here at the time of the revolution. In fact, he uh, lost uh, uh, an arm in the siege of Bayar. He, he was uh, shot and wounded at the, the, the Baramendi Palace at the same time that, that Ben Milam lost his life. He survived. He was actually rescued by Sam Maverick, as some people in the audience will, will definitely know. Uh, and um, ended up becoming the contractor for the capital of the Republic of Texas in Houston. And by golly, when you look at this and compare it, this is the Dolores R.P. house in uh, New Orleans, unfortunately. Now uh, an entrance ramp for a bridge. Uh, so it, it's gone, gone, gone. But you can see the similarity between the Texas capital. And the interesting thing is the specifications for this building survive in New Orleans at the notarial archives. And so that's interesting. The, the framework, the, the, the thinking of Thomas William Ward is, well, we're just going to do this like any New Orleans building uh, that, that you know, we, we'll come up with the, the drawings, we'll, we'll verbally describe it all, and then we'll put it on, on, uh, uh, on record. And um, here's another uh, house uh, from uh, Louisiana. And you can see the similarities here between the legation on the left and Bajatel Plantation, uh, which is exact, built exactly the same time as the, the, the legation, but uh, uh, near Donaldsonville, so it's uh, Mississippi River Valley. Uh, here's a photo and uh, a Habs floor plan here. Now, look at the floor plan on the right there, and you notice something's missing. It doesn't have a central passage. In fact, oops, oh, oops. Go back for, there we go. Yes, those two green buttons are killing me. Um, it has double doors, like the legation does. And there's actually a room. And it, there's uh, pocket doors, so it's a double parlor. And the fireplaces are on the side walls rather than, than the walls between front and back room. But uh, this is the French way of doing things, of the, uh, uh, having the entrance actually into the most formal room in the house. And it's kind of interesting because the double parlor is the American part of it coming in to play there. But the double parlor in an American house would be on either the left side or the right side, but not in the middle. So, so it's interesting uh, the, the difference there between how it works in Louisiana as opposed to the way the legation does. And here are three different uh, photos of the, 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 the legation's passageway. Uh, and amazingly intact. Um, the, uh, the, the one on the left taken by David R. Williams, the uh, important uh, uh, Texas architect, uh, late 1920s or early 30s, uh, a historic photo by me from uh, uh, 15, 16 years ago, 2005, and then uh, one from a couple of weeks ago uh, showing the, the, the new paint treatment. Um, and 
the, the, the walls of the legation have been through a number of paint treatments over the years, and our, our, our ability to do microscopic paint analysis is uh, uh, better and better. And so uh, I, I feel pretty confident that, that we now have the right uh, colors on it. Another cool thing that, that reflects the Louisiana influence uh, are these ram's horn hinges. Um, you see the detail from a Habs drawing on the left and actually uh, a, a recent photograph here on the right. But you can find those in Louisiana, in New Orleans, and uh, the Madame John's legacy, it's kind of kind of hard to see it, but there are ram's horn hinges uh, all the way through here. And here's a Habs drawing from New Orleans, and this is in the Bartolomeo Bosque house uh, in the, the quarter, which is from the era when Spain was in charge of Louisiana, which uh, Francis Galvan was just talking about uh, over in the Los Adias uh, session. So uh, that's interesting. Or uh, the James Petod house uh, is an, another great Creole house that uh, has a central saw, the central parlor, rather than going into a, a hallway there. So all pretty cool in that regard. So the last thing I'll mention is uh, a letter from uh, Anson Jones to his uh, wife, Mary, who I believe was maybe back in Washington on the Brazos. He wrote, our old friend, Mr. Salani, has his house furnished and, uh, finished and furnished in almost regal magnificence. I was over it with his steward yesterday. The furniture is Pari Parisian and beautiful. The colors are orange, damask, and gold. And so uh, here are the, the two pieces of, of furniture thought to be by Dubois, uh, owned by Dubois, the uh, armchair and the sofa, which have been nicely reupholstered uh, in the, uh, a, a, uh, an orange textile. So uh, pretty cool to see that. It's, it's very period uh, uh, appropriate. Um, the, the story behind those is actually very interesting, that it was the, the sofa uh, was donated to the DRT Museum in the old land office in 1917 by Emma Kyle Burleson, and she gave the armchair to Miss Lily Robertson when she was uh, at the legation, uh, still living in the legation as the Robertson house. But you can actually track the story back to uh, the uh, father of Virginia Wilson Spence, who purchased them from Thomas William Ward. So the, the documentation is really quite cool in, uh, in that regard. And uh, interestingly enough, that is a, uh, an armchair that was owned by Anson Jones, who was admiring of the furniture at the, the French legation. So quite, quite interesting. And finally, uh, Dubois let, we don't know that he actually lived in the legation house, but he did allow uh, Henri Castro, who was coming to uh, settle the area west of San Antonio. And Dubois complained that, that, that I offered him the house and he took it. Uh, he was not very happy uh, that, that Henry Castro stayed and made himself at home while he was in town. And so Castro ended up founding Castroville and there's the, the view of that. So important things happened in the history of Texas at the house, even though it was not necessarily lived in by Dubois. He certainly created it, uh, furnished it, and uh, it's a remarkable site. And hope you guys will be able to visit at some point. So, uh, and you see that, uh, that Creole influence even here in San Antonio. This looks like it could be in Louisiana, but this was the, the, the Francois Louis de Mazier's store at uh, Martinez in South Alamo, or even the hipped roof of the Ruiz house, which is just out these doors right here, uh, is really quite strikingly of this, uh, this character. And a historic photo of that early on after its move to the Witty. But there you have it, the, uh, the story of the French legation in brief. Thank you guys very much. So now we will take questions. Hello? Well, I've been there on several occasions and find it is immensely charming. Part of it, I think, is the site, yes. but also it is the building, and I'm talking about the main one itself. Do you think it's that French? How much input did Mr. Dubois have? I always thought maybe it's that just that French sense of style or what? Yeah, entirely possible. Do I need to now use the other microphone? Is it not working? 
I'm, I'm there. Okay. Uh, I was just being reticent, which is unlike me. That's one of the things that we don't really have that much documentation on how the conversation went between Dubois and his builders, um, how, how familiar he was with French Creole architecture from, from Louisiana. I mean, he'd gone through, he'd seen New Orleans. Um, so whether he was familiar with enough to say, I really like those ram horn hinges or things like that. There are lots and lots of details that probably had to be filled out by the builders of the house. And it may well be that Thomas William Ward, who built the Capitol in Houston and then moved to Austin, was the builder for the legation. We don't have mm -hmm. solid evidence on that, but he's a leading candidate for that. Anyone else? Question? So I'm not quite sure. I, I've heard that it's going to be in July, but then I've also heard that it's going to be in the fall. So we will definitely do a huge marketing campaign for that when it is going to reopen. It'll be a grand reopening. Well, so. Very good. Well, thank you guys for, for coming. Ta-da. All right. If some of you want to come and look at his books, Kenneth Hafferty has books up here. <laughs>